happened at a wedding that let you know the marriage was going to end in a divorce? Story 1. One Monday early in the week, we got a call about an upcoming Saturday wedding. The bride had called to cancel. It wasn't unusual for us to handle these kinds of things. Though the stakes were always high, weddings are emotional, stressful events, and it was never surprising when something went wrong. In this case, it wasn't just an emotional call. We had to inform her that canceling so late in the game would mean losing the deposit, around $7,000. That was the policy, no exceptions. She seemed calm about it, surprisingly so. I'd dealt with plenty of brides who had lost it over much less. After the call, I remember thinking how odd it was. It wasn't uncommon for a wedding to get canceled. We'd had more than a few fall apart in the final days. But most people at least fought the deposit loss. This one didn't. She simply accepted it and hung up. The rest of the week went on like usual, though we were a bit less busy with the cancellation. Then on Thursday, we got another call. It was the same bride, and this time she was back in full wedding mode. The wedding's back on, she said. No apology for the confusion. No explanation as to why the sudden change of heart. I could hear the stress in her voice, though. She was frazzled, that much was clear. But still, we went ahead and scrambled to put everything back together. A canceled wedding is one thing. A wedding that gets rebooked two days before the event is something else entirely. By the time Saturday rolled around, the guests started arriving. Normally, wedding guests are excited, happy to be there, ready for a good time. Not this crowd. From the moment they stepped through the doors, it was clear that something was off. Everyone seemed tense, irritated even. They all had the same expressions. A mix of confusion and frustration. We didn't know the full story. But we figured out quickly that the couple must have told everyone the wedding was off only to turn around and send word that it was back on just a couple of days later. The ceremony itself was the quickest I'd ever seen. It couldn't have been more than three minutes long. The bride and groom rushed through their vows, barely making eye contact. There was none of the usual emotional weight that comes with exchanging rings. It felt mechanical, like they were just checking off a box on a to-do list. As soon as the ceremony ended, the bride made a beeline for the dressing room and came back out in sweatpants. I've seen brides change into more comfortable outfits before, but usually it's something elegant or at least wedding-related. Sweatpants, though. That was a first. By then, the mood had soured even more. The guests, already irritated, started drinking. Heavily? It didn't take long for the entire reception to devolve into a mess of angry, drunk people. There were raised voices, a few broken glasses, and a couple of near fights. At one point, I remember one of the groomsmen, already several drinks deep, slurring something about how the whole thing had been a mistake. Should have stayed canceled, he mumbled, barely able to stand. It was chaos, but no one seemed to care. The bride sat at her table, stone-faced, barely engaging with anyone. The groom was nowhere to be found. I couldn't help but think, this marriage won't last long. You could just feel it in the air. The resentment, the tension, the way no one really seemed happy to be there, least of all the couple themselves. I had no doubt that the whole thing was on its last legs before it even began. Sure enough, the very next Monday, I got confirmation of what I'd suspected all along. I happened to be at my then-wife's divorce attorney's office, dealing with my own unfortunate circumstances. While I was sitting in the waiting room, who should walk in but the bride from that chaotic wedding? She didn't recognize me, of course. She probably didn't remember much of that day, given how out of it she seemed. But I recognized her immediately. There she was. Less than 48 hours after her wedding, walking into a divorce attorney's office, I couldn't help but think how absurd it all was. The whole thing, from the last-minute cancellation to the short-lived ceremony to the wreck of a reception, had been doomed from the start. I almost felt sorry for her. Almost. As I sat there, waiting for my own meeting, I overheard her talking to the receptionist. She was already asking about paperwork and procedures. The receptionist, clearly accustomed to such things, didn't bat an eye. For her, this was just another client, another case. But for me, it was a strange, full-circle moment. I had seen the beginning of this marriage. And now, just as quickly, I was witnessing the end. Story 2. Our close friend, the bride, had spent an entire year meticulously planning her wedding day. Every detail had been carefully thought out and executed, from the invitations to the flowers to the seating arrangements. It was all consuming for her, and for good reason— she had been dreaming about this day for as long as we'd known her. She poured her heart and soul into every decision, treating the wedding as a culmination of everything she hoped for in her future. For six months leading up to the big day, she and her fiancé had even taken dance lessons. It was something she was particularly excited about, a beautifully choreographed first dance that would make her wedding unforgettable. 
She worked tirelessly to perfect her steps, dragging her fiancé to rehearsals and spending hours in front of mirrors practicing her moves. It wasn't just about the dance, though. It was symbolic of what she wanted from the marriage itself, grace, harmony, and a sense of partnership. On top of that, she dedicated an absurd amount of time to picking out the perfect dresses for her bridesmaids, which included my wife. Each outfit was thoughtfully chosen to complement the color scheme of the wedding, and she even handpicked accessories for them. She wanted everyone to look perfect, to feel beautiful on her special day. It was a lot of pressure, but we all understood it was because she cared so deeply. So, when the wedding night finally came around, everyone was excited. The ceremony itself had gone off without a hitch, with all the typical emotions swirling around. A few tears of joy, some laughter, and lots of congratulatory hugs. It felt like the day she had worked so hard for was going exactly as planned. That was until the reception began. The groom, it turns out, hadn't taken the preparations nearly as seriously. He was excited, sure, but in a more casual, nonchalant way. The moment the formalities of the ceremony were over, he reunited with a group of his old friends. They hadn't seen each other in years, and in what seemed like a fit of nostalgia, they quickly began downing drinks. At first, it was just fun and games. Laughing, telling old stories, catching up. But then things took a turn. Before long, the groom was drinking far more than he should have. He wasn't just tipsy. He was rapidly getting blackout drunk. It happened so quickly that most of us didn't even realize how far gone he was until it was too late. By the time the wedding party was set to make its rounds and greet the guests, he was already stumbling. He didn't even seem to recognize us. His new in-laws, his closest friends, none of us. He just brushed us aside in a drunken haze, trying to make his way to the bathroom. It was embarrassing, to say the least, but we tried to laugh it off. After all, it was a wedding. People get drunk at weddings, right? The real heartbreak, though, came during the first dance. This was supposed to be the highlight of the evening for our friend. After all those lessons and all that practice, she had been so excited to share this moment with her new husband, to wow everyone with their carefully choreographed routine. The music started, and they stepped onto the dance floor ready for their big moment. But it quickly became apparent that the groom had no idea what was going on. He was so drunk that he could barely stand, let alone remember the dance steps they had rehearsed for months. He tripped over his own feet and stumbled around the floor like he was lost. Our friend tried to lead him, her face tightening with anxiety as she realized the dream dance she'd envisioned was unraveling before her eyes. She looked absolutely panicked. I could see the heartbreak on her face as the realization sunk in. The dance was ruined. Everything she had worked for, everything she had envisioned, was falling apart right there in front of everyone. What should have been a beautiful, romantic moment between the newlyweds turned into a disaster. The guests fell into an awkward silence, watching as she tried to guide her husband through the dance. But it was no use. He was beyond help, stumbling, swaying off rhythm, completely disconnected from the moment. She tried to smile through it, but it was clear she was devastated. It was painful to watch. At the time, I remember thinking, this marriage won't last six months. It was clear that they were on completely different pages. She had wanted a picture-perfect day, a representation of the life she hoped to have with him, organized, beautiful, full of effort and love. He, on the other hand, seemed content to live in the moment, to party and have fun without much regard for the future. But surprisingly, they managed to stay together for three years. I still don't know how they did it. Maybe it was inertia, or maybe there was something there that the rest of us didn't see. Either way, their relationship lingered on, though from the outside it always seemed fragile. Story 3. My cousin's wedding was the kind of event that you look back on, shake your head, and wonder how you didn't see the disaster coming from a mile away. He married a lovely girl from Connecticut, a girl who, by all accounts, came from a good family. She was respectable, refined, and well-spoken, everything you'd expect from someone raised in that polished New England environment. But my cousin? Well, he was the exact opposite. Born and raised in Norfolk County, Massachusetts, he was the living, breathing stereotype of the rough-around-the-edges, loud-mouthed guy who never quite grew up. Everyone in the family had their doubts, of course. When he first introduced her to the family, we all wondered how long it would last. I don't think anyone was questioning her. She was sweet, probably too sweet. But him? That was another story. He had always been a bit of a wild card. The kind of guy who spent more time getting into trouble than staying out of it. So, when they announced their engagement, we all sort of braced ourselves for what was to come. The night before the wedding, my cousin went out with his crew, a group of guys who'd been with him since high school. They were the Mickeys and Sullys of the world. 
the kind of guys who never missed a Bruins game and thought that a good night out wasn't complete unless someone got kicked out of a bar. Predictably, they spent the night getting absolutely wrecked. By the time morning rolled around, I wasn't surprised when I saw my cousin already half in the bag, nursing a pint of Skull vodka like it was water. He greeted me with that same, eating grin I'd seen on his face countless times before, the one that always told me he was already too far gone. We were supposed to be taking pictures before the ceremony, but my cousin had other priorities. After one more swig from the bottle, he tossed it into the corner of the church, laughed, and then hurled an insult at his best friend, calling him a cockfag in front of the priest. Classy, right? I pulled him aside, forced a couple of cups of coffee into him, and thought for a brief moment that maybe, just maybe, we could pull this off without a complete disaster. Boy, was I wrong! The ceremony started and I thought we were in the clear. He seemed composed enough as the bride walked down the aisle, but it didn't take long for the cracks to show. First, during the vows, he started flipping off the guests, twice. I could see the bride's father turning redder with every passing second. Then, as they knelt during the mass, everyone got a good look at the bottom of his shoes, where his brother had taped, Help Me, in big, bold letters. The guests, mostly the bride's side of the family, were horrified. I could feel the tension in the room like a thick cloud hanging over us. The bride's father looked like he was ready to explode, but it wasn't over yet. No, the real chaos was waiting for us at the reception. My mother didn't even want to go. She had a bad feeling about it from the start, and honestly, I wish we had listened to her. When we got to the venue, it was immediately clear that my cousin had picked up right where he left off. He was guzzling booze like there was no tomorrow, and his friends were more than happy to join in. It was a scene straight out of a frat party, and the bride's family, who were clearly expecting something much more civilized, were watching in stunned silence. Then came the first dance. The bride, bless her heart, was still trying to hold it together. She wanted to make the most of the day, even after all the chaos, so she insisted they go ahead with the planned dance to stand by me. But my cousin? He didn't even bother putting down his drink. As the music started, he was sloppily swaying with her, one hand holding his beer, the other grabbing at her backside in front of everyone. The bride looked mortified, but she was trying to stay composed, trying to get through the dance. And then it happened. My cousin, in his drunken stupor, spilled his entire drink down the front of her dress. The bride froze, staring at the wet stain spreading across her white gown, her face a mix of shock and rage. Without missing a beat, she slapped him, hard. The sound echoed through the room, and everything went silent. For a moment, it looked like my cousin was going to let it go, but then, in classic fashion, he shoved her back, sending her stumbling. That's when all hell broke loose. The bride's father, who had been holding himself together by a thread, stormed the dance floor ready to take my cousin out. The next thing I knew, it was an all-out brawl. His buddies rushed to hold him back and the groomsmen piled in. The whole place erupted in chaos with guests yelling and tables getting knocked over. My brother and I looked at each other, then at our mother, who was sitting there quietly, taking it all in. We asked her if she wanted us to jump in and help, but she simply grabbed her purse, stood up and said, let's leave. On our way out, we paused for a moment near the door. My mother, usually a quiet, reserved woman, walked straight up to my cousin, who was still being held back by his friends, and slapped him across the face. Thank God your grandmother passed away before she had to see this, she said in a calm, steady voice. You disgraceful little mick. It was the most shocking thing I'd seen all night, and that's saying something. We got out of there as two cops were walking in. They'd been called to break up the fight, and honestly, I was relieved to be leaving before things got any worse. A week later, the annulment process began. The bride didn't waste any time. She was gone, and I can't say I blame her. As for my cousin, I haven't spoken to him since. The last I heard, he was living in a camper, bouncing from place to place, still making the same bad decisions. He did email me once, asking if he could borrow $5,000. I never responded. Some things never change, I guess. Story 4. It was clear from the beginning that their relationship was built on shaky ground. They weren't the type of couple you'd expect to see getting married under normal circumstances. In fact, the only reason they decided to tie the knot in the first place was because, on their very first date, they had an unprotected, spontaneous close encounter, and soon after, she found out she was pregnant. It was one of those situations where everything happened too fast, too soon, and before they really had time to think things through, they were already planning a wedding. It was clear that neither of them was really prepared for what marriage entailed. But with a baby on the way, 
they figured they had no other choice but to make it work. They wanted to do what they thought was the right thing, provide a stable environment for their child. The wedding planning began in a hurry, with both families scrambling to put something together. There wasn't much romance to it, more of a sense of obligation, really. But they pushed forward, both hoping that somehow things would fall into place. As the months went by, cracks in their relationship quickly started to show. The bride came from a deeply religious background, and while this wasn't a problem in and of itself, it started to become apparent that her views were far more rigid than anyone expected, including her new husband. She had strong opinions about how things should be done, especially when it came to her faith. The groom, on the other hand, wasn't particularly religious and had always surrounded himself with a diverse group of friends who lived very different lifestyles than the ones she believed in. This included friends who were part of the LGBTQ plus community, people who didn't fit neatly into her worldview. The first major issue arose just a few months into the pregnancy when they started discussing wedding details. The groom suggested that they get the flowers for the wedding from one of his close friends, who ran a successful floral business. This friend happened to be which had never been an issue for the groom. But when the bride heard the suggestion, she flat out refused. At first, the groom thought it was simply a matter of personal preference. Maybe she didn't like the style of the flowers, or maybe she had another florist in mind. But when he pressed her on it, her real objection came out. I can't support that kind of lifestyle, she said, her voice full of conviction. I have a religious obligation to not associate with those kinds of people. We can't get our wedding flowers from him. The groom was stunned. He hadn't realized until that moment just how deeply her beliefs ran or how incompatible they were with his own. He tried to reason with her, explaining that his friend was a good person, that they'd known each other for years, and that this had nothing to do with lifestyle choices. But she was unmoved. To her, it was a matter of morality, and there was no room for compromise. It didn't stop there. As they continued planning the wedding, more and more of the groom's friends came under scrutiny. She made it clear that anyone who didn't fit into her strict religious view of what was acceptable wouldn't be welcome at the wedding. People he had known for years, friends who had been there for him through thick and thin, were suddenly persona non grata in her eyes. The groom, who had never been one to judge people based on their personal lives, was horrified. He had always prided himself on having a diverse group of friends, people from all walks of life, and now his soon-to-be wife was telling him that many of them weren't even allowed to be part of their special day. The more she revealed about her beliefs, the more he realized how little they actually had in common. He felt trapped. The baby hadn't even been born yet, and already the cracks in their relationship were widening into deep chasms. Every conversation seemed to end in a fight, and every decision about the wedding or the baby's future became a battleground. He couldn't believe that this was the person he was about to marry, the person who was supposed to be his partner in raising their child. It was becoming increasingly clear to him that they had rushed into this marriage for all the wrong reasons. Yes, there was a baby on the way, but what kind of environment were they creating for that child? They were fundamentally incompatible, and he knew it. The love he thought he might be able to build with her had been buried under layers of religious dogma and judgment, and it seemed impossible to dig their way out. As the due date for the baby grew closer, so did the inevitability of divorce. He confided in a few of his close friends, those she had deemed unacceptable, and they all gave him the same advice. He had to think about the future, not just for himself, but for the child. What kind of life would they have together if they couldn't even agree on basic human decency? What would it mean for their child to grow up in a home filled with conflict and resentment? Finally, just a few short months before the baby was due, the groom made the difficult decision. He couldn't go through with the marriage. He couldn't spend the rest of his life with someone who saw the world in such a narrow, judgmental way. The divorce papers were filed, and the wedding that was supposed to solidify their future together never happened. It was a painful decision, but one that ultimately saved them both from a lifetime of unhappiness. The baby was born shortly after, and while they agreed to co-parent, their relationship was never the same. They remained civil for the sake of their child, but any hope of reconciliation was long gone. Story 5 Looking back on my wedding day, I still can't believe how I didn't see the warning signs. I guess when you're caught up in the rush of planning, the excitement, and the pressure to make things work, you ignore the red flags waving right in front of your face. But now all I can do is laugh at how absurd it all was, and how relieved I am to be out of that mess. The first thing that sticks out is how he never once looked me in the eyes during the entire ceremony. Not even a glance. I was standing right there, the woman he was about to marry, and he couldn't be bothered to meet my gaze. 
Instead, he just stared at the preacher the whole time like I wasn't even there. At first, I thought maybe he was nervous. People act strange under stress, right? But as the ceremony dragged on, it became more and more obvious that this wasn't about nerves. It was like he was deliberately avoiding looking at me. I didn't know what to make of it, but I pushed the feeling aside, telling myself I was being silly. Then came the moment when it was time for the traditional, you may now kiss the bride. I was expecting, you know, the kind of kiss that feels like a celebration, like, hey, we're married now, but no. Instead of kissing me, he grabbed my hand and gave it a quick peck, like he was some kind of medieval knight in a bad romance novel. The guests all let out this awkward little chuckle, probably thinking it was some cute, quirky gesture, but I knew better. This wasn't cute. This was weird. Still, I tried to make excuses for him. I had spent so much time planning the wedding, imagining the future we'd have together, and convincing myself that we were in love. But in that moment, I started to realize I didn't really know the man standing next to me, and what I was about to find out would only confirm it. The real kicker came later, and it was something I never could have predicted. It wasn't long after the wedding that I found out something truly horrifying. His father, yes, his own father, had been making inappropriate comments about me. Apparently his dad had taken a strong interest in me, and not in a father-in-law kind of way. He had told my husband that he found me attractive, but not just in a casual way. No, this man actually told his son that he wanted to pound me. I couldn't believe it when my husband casually dropped this bomb on me, like it was no big deal. I was stunned. What kind of man would be okay with his own father saying something so disgusting about his wife? I thought for sure my husband would be outraged, embarrassed something. But instead, he just shrugged it off, like it was the most normal thing in the world. He actually said something like, well, that's just how my dad is. He's always been like that, as if that somehow made it okay. I was completely appalled. It was one thing for his father to be a creep, but for my own husband to think this behavior was acceptable? That was the moment I knew I had made a huge mistake. I felt sick to my stomach, trapped in a marriage that I realized was built on lies and complete ignorance of who this man really was. I thought about all the other moments I had brushed off, the way he acted distant, the way he never seemed that excited about anything having to do with our relationship. Suddenly, everything made sense. He hadn't been nervous at the wedding. He just didn't care. He wasn't invested in me or our future together. And the fact that he could defend his father's creepy behavior was the last straw. That was the beginning of the end for us. I wasn't going to put up with that kind of insanity. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized how blind I'd been to all the red flags leading up to the wedding. His odd behavior, his lack of connection with me, it all pointed to a man who wasn't ready for marriage or even really interested in being a husband. To be honest, it's a miracle we even got as far as we did. But after that conversation about his father, I knew I couldn't stay. I wasn't about to live the rest of my life feeling disrespected, knowing that my husband didn't even have my back when it came to something as vile as his father's comments. So I started planning my exit. Story 6. I've worked in hotels for years, and with that comes the privilege, or maybe the curse, of witnessing a lot of weddings. You'd think after seeing so many, they'd all start to blur together. Just another bride and groom, just another set of speeches, dances, and cake cutting. But let me tell you, there are some weddings that stand out for all the wrong reasons. One in particular still sticks with me, and I'm pretty sure it's the wildest thing I've ever seen. It started out as a pretty typical affair. The hotel was decked out for the occasion, flowers everywhere, a live band, and a huge buffet. The bride's family had clearly spared no expense. This was a fancy wedding. The couple seemed like your average pair, nothing too unusual. I didn't sense any tension or anything that might have indicated the storm brewing behind the scenes. Guests were mingling, the drinks were flowing, and the mood was lively. All signs pointed to a lovely evening ahead. As the reception carried on, it reached that part of the night where the speeches begin. You know, the usual lineup, father of the bride, maid of honor, best man. Everyone was gathered around, a bit tipsy, but mostly just enjoying the night. The best man took the microphone and gave what seemed like a standard, light-hearted speech. He talked about how long he had known the groom, threw in a few funny stories, teased the couple a bit, nothing out of the ordinary. Everyone clapped and laughed at all the right moments. It was all going according to plan. But then, after the best man handed back the microphone, something happened that no one in that room was prepared for. The groom stood up. There was nothing strange about that at first, of course. People assumed he was going to give his own little thank you speech or maybe say something sweet about his new wife. But that's not what he did. Instead, he walked up, took the microphone, and delivered the bombshell of all bombshells. I just wanted to let everyone know that the bride is screwing the best man, he said. 
his voice steady but cold. The whole room fell silent. No one could believe what they were hearing. Some people thought it was a joke at first, but then he continued, and the mood shifted instantly. I've known for a while, he said, his eyes sweeping across the stunned crowd. But I wanted the bride's family to spend a ton of money on this wedding before I let everyone know the truth. You could hear a pin drop. The bride, who had been sitting there, smiling just moments before, looked like she had been hit by a truck. Her face went pale, and her mouth dropped open, but no words came out. The best man standing just a few feet away froze like a deer in headlights, completely shell-shocked. Everyone in the room was waiting for someone to say something, to do something, but the groom didn't give them the chance. After delivering his devastating announcement, he calmly set the microphone down, turned on his heel, and walked out of the reception hall without looking back. I'll never forget the chaos that erupted after he left. At first there was just this stunned silence, as people tried to process what had just happened. Then the whispers started. People were looking around, wide-eyed, trying to figure out if it was true or if they had just witnessed the most insane wedding prank ever. But as the moments ticked by, it became clear that this wasn't a joke. This was very, very real. The bride's family, who had clearly spent a fortune on this wedding, looked absolutely horrified. Her father's face turned beet red, and he stormed off after the groom, probably to try to get some answers. The mother of the bride just sat there, stunned, not knowing what to do. The guests were in complete disarray. Some people were huddling together, gossiping furiously. Others just got up and left, not wanting to stick around for the fallout. As for the bride, she sat frozen for a while, completely blindsided. Eventually, she got up and ran out of the room, tears streaming down her face. The best man, meanwhile, had disappeared into the crowd, clearly hoping to avoid any more attention. But you could see it in people's faces. They knew exactly what had gone down, and they weren't about to forget it anytime soon. Story 7 It's not easy to look back on my wedding mostly because it was a disaster from the start. But I guess when you're caught up in something as complicated as an arranged marriage, you don't always see the signs, or maybe you just choose to ignore them. Either way, I found myself walking down the aisle with a bride who, in hindsight, never really wanted to be there in the first place. And honestly, neither did I. The whole thing had been set up by our moms. They'd been friends for years, and somewhere along the way, they decided that their children should get married. I wasn't thrilled about the idea. But I was raised in a family where you listen to your parents, especially your mom. I didn't want to let her down, so I went along with it. As for the bride, she was in the same boat, pressured by her family to go through with a wedding she clearly didn't want. It became obvious early on that there was no chemistry between us. We never really connected, not during the engagement and certainly not on the wedding day. She was distant, even cold. But I kept telling myself that things would get better once we were married. I figured we just needed time to get comfortable with each other that maybe the awkwardness would fade once the formalities were over. I was wrong. From the moment the ceremony began, something felt off. During the vows, she wouldn't even look at me. When it came time to kiss at the end of the ceremony, she flat out refused. The officiant awkwardly paused, waiting for us to kiss. But she just stood there, staring straight ahead, unwilling to budge. So, I gave her a quick peck on the cheek, trying to play it off like it wasn't a big deal, but I could feel everyone's eyes on us, wondering what was going on. The rest of the day wasn't much better. For the photos, she reluctantly held my hand. But the second the photographer looked away or anyone's back was turned, she would yank her hand away like it burned. I remember trying to make small talk with her, trying to be polite, but she was completely uninterested. I kept telling myself she was just nervous, that weddings can be overwhelming, but deep down I knew this wasn't just nerves. She didn't want to be there with me. At the reception, she kept her distance, spending most of the time with her friends while I awkwardly tried to entertain guests and keep up appearances. I tried to dance with her, but she barely lasted through one song before finding an excuse to walk away. It was humiliating, really. Everyone could see that something was wrong, but no one said anything. We all just pretended like everything was fine, even though it was clear to everyone that it wasn't. The weirdest part, though, was how fast everything unraveled after the wedding. We barely lasted a month before she asked for a divorce. I was surprised, but not really. By that point, it was clear we weren't going to make it. We couldn't even pretend to be happy together for more than a few weeks. What I didn't expect was how quickly she moved on. Not long after we split, I found out that she had remarried within a few months. At first, I was shocked. How could she move on that quickly? But then the real story came out. Turns out she had been in another relationship the whole time, even before we got married. The wedding had just been a formality, something her mom had pushed her into and she went through with it even though her heart was somewhere else. Story 8. 
My sister once found herself in the middle of one of the most chaotic weddings I've ever heard of. She was a bridesmaid, and from what she told me, the day had started off like any other wedding, full of excitement, nerves, and anticipation. No one had any clue that by the end of it, the whole thing would unravel in a way no one could have predicted. The bride and groom seemed like your average couple, happy to be getting married and surrounded by family and friends. But there was something lurking beneath the surface that none of us knew about. Something that would bring the whole wedding crashing down before it even had a chance to really begin. Apparently, the groom had a history with, specifically with Cola, and had kicked the habit long ago. But for some reason, he decided that his wedding day, the day that was supposed to mark the start of his new life, would also be the day he'd revisit his old demons. No one knew at first. The ceremony went off without a hitch. My sister said the bride looked beautiful, the vows were sweet, and there were the usual happy tears from family and friends. The reception was held at a nice hotel and everything seemed to be going according to plan. But by the time the party was in full swing, the groom started to act a little off. At first, people thought he was just drunk. After all, it's not unusual for the groom to have a few too many drinks on his wedding day. But as the night wore on, his behavior became more erratic. He was sweating profusely, fidgeting, and seemed far more jittery than someone who'd simply had too much to drink. My sister said he kept disappearing for long stretches of time, only to reappear more wired than before, talking a mile a minute to anyone who'd listen. The bride was visibly uncomfortable as the night went on. She was trying to keep up appearances, smiling for the guests and posing for photos but it was clear that something wasn't right. At one point, my sister and the other bridesmaids huddled together, trying to figure out what was going on with the groom. No one could get a straight answer out of him, and by the end of the night, he had vanished altogether, leaving the bride to finish out the reception alone. The next morning was when things really went off the rails. As everyone was gathering for breakfast in the hotel lobby, there was a commotion by the elevators. The groom had been found unresponsive in his hotel room, and paramedics were called. My sister watched in disbelief as the groom was wheeled out on a stretcher, completely unconscious. It was a surreal moment. This was the man who had just gotten married less than 24 hours ago, and now he was being rushed to the hospital after what everyone suspected was a drug overdose. It didn't take long for the truth to come out. Word spread quickly that the groom had relapsed on his cola habit during the wedding. He had been using throughout the entire day, from the ceremony to the reception, and it all came crashing down that morning when he failed to wake up. The bride, who had already been humiliated in front of all her friends and family, was furious. She stormed into the hospital later that day and dumped him right then and there, effectively ending the marriage less than 18 hours after it had begun. It was a shocking end to what was supposed to be the happiest day of their lives. No one knew what to say, least of all my sister, who had spent months helping plan the wedding, only for it to end in a total disaster. But the strangest part of it all? The bride, despite everything that had happened, still went ahead and cashed every single wedding check they had received. The kicker? Her parents had paid for the entire wedding. They footed the bill for everything. The venue, the catering, the flowers, you name it. So it's not like she needed the money. Story 9. When we walked into the reception, it immediately felt off. A quarter of the guests were under the age of 18, which struck everyone as strange. We thought maybe some of the kids were relatives, younger siblings, or cousins of the bride or groom. But no, it turns out these kids were all guests of the groom, and they weren't family. They were his current and former students from the high school where he taught. It didn't take long for people to piece together what was really going on. As we mingled with the guests, we found out that the bride and most of her friends were also former students of the groom. He had taught them all in high school. The entire vibe was more than awkward. It felt like we were attending a reunion where the bride was marrying her former teacher, and many of the guests were teenagers who had walked out of his classroom just a few years earlier. Most of the conversations at the wedding revolved around school stories. The bride's bridesmaids shared stories about when they were in his English class, and some of the underage guests spoke about how cool it was to be invited to a teacher's wedding. But there was a creeping discomfort that settled in as people realized that the relationship between the bride and groom hadn't started in the most conventional way. The more we learned, the stranger it got. Apparently, the couple had met when the bride was still a student at his high school, although everyone insisted that nothing inappropriate had happened back then. They swore that they had reconnected years after she graduated when she was an adult and teaching herself. But even with that explanation, the whole situation felt off. Here was a man in his 40s, celebrating his wedding with a room full of students. 
former and current. And the bride? She had been one of them. As the night went on, it became impossible to ignore the whispers. People were uneasy. It wasn't just the age gap or the fact that he had taught her in high school. There were rumors circulating that the groom had a reputation, one that was much darker than anyone had let on. Fast forward a few months, and we all got the news that made everything click into place. The couple was getting a divorce, and the reason behind it was as unsettling as the vibe at the wedding had been. It turned out that the groom had been involved in an inappropriate relationship with one of his students. Not a former student, but a current one. He had crossed the line, and it wasn't just a scandal. It was a betrayal of everything a teacher is supposed to stand for. The divorce came quickly after the news broke. The bride was devastated, and her entire world was turned upside down. She had married someone she thought she knew, someone who had been her teacher and then her husband. But she wasn't the only one left shaken by the revelation. Many of the guests at the wedding, myself included, felt like we had witnessed something sinister in the making. Story 9. Jan's wedding was doomed from the start. It wasn't just that everyone could see it coming. It was more like we were all witnessing an inevitable disaster unfold in slow motion. In the backwoods of North Carolina, about 15 years ago, John's nuptials seemed more like the opening act of a tragicomedy than the blissful union of two people in love. My family, well, we're just a generation or two removed from snake handling in church, so you can imagine that we've got our fair share of quirks. It's like we're a strange mix of inbreeding redneck stubbornness and a stubborn desire for upward mobility. This wedding wasn't going to break that mold. The proposal itself was probably the first red flag, and if you ask me, it should have stopped the whole train in its tracks. Jan's fiancé, let's call him Todd, had chosen the worst moment in history to pop the question. Picture this. Jan's dad, who wasn't in the best of health, suddenly collapsed in the living room while the family was watching TV. Emergency services weren't fast enough, and he passed away before help arrived. Jan, sitting beside her father's body, was in shock, naturally. That's when Todd, in an unthinkable act of insensitivity, grabbed Jan by the hands, pulled her to her feet, and proposed, right there, over her dead father's body. He later told people he didn't want her to get away. Classy. You'd think after such a horrific moment things couldn't get worse, but you'd be wrong. Todd vanished a week after the funeral. No one had any idea where he was. Jan was left to grieve her father, now engaged and with no fiancé in sight. It was a month before he turned up again. During that time, Jan's mom, my Aunt Lisa, was also less than helpful. Aunt Lisa, who is the definition of white trash, had a new boyfriend and was planning to move out of state to escape bill collectors. She put a deadline on Jan's wedding, insisting it had to happen within four months because I ain't sticking around for your mess, Jan. I got my own problems. Eventually, Todd resurfaced, acting suspiciously, but still promising to marry Jan. It wasn't long before the truth came out. During his mysterious absence, Todd had been living with his ex-girlfriend. Apparently, the ex had given him an ultimatum, spend a month with her, or she'd take him to court for child support on their infant son, a child Todd hadn't been supporting at all. And yet, despite all this, Jan still insisted she wanted to marry him. My mom and I took on most of the wedding planning because Jan's mom despite being the one pushing for the quick wedding, refused to spend a dime on it. She was too busy getting ready to run off with her new man. Mom and I didn't really believe the wedding would happen. We figured it would be canceled any day. But the day arrived, and so did Todd and Jan. That's when things really went off the rails. Todd showed up with a massive thermos full of Pabst Blue Ribbon, sipping it through a ridiculous novelty straw, telling anyone who would listen that Jan was his starter wife. You could almost see the whole room cringe. Jan, for her part, wasn't exactly a picture of calm, either. She threw several tantrums throughout the day. At one point, she accused Todd of stealing her drink and flew into a rage. Todd, ever the charmer, called her a dumb worker in response. But once she found her drink, the storm passed. For the moment, the reception was even worse. Todd, in a moment of juvenile stupidity, pulled the ring off Jan's finger and swallowed it. As a joke, I still don't understand what his thought process was. If there was one, then, a fight broke out between Todd and his father. Todd had apparently invited his ex-girlfriend to the wedding, and when his dad told her to stay home, Todd lost it. Jan didn't even know about the invitation until fists were flying. It was a mess. Of course, the marriage didn't last. Nobody, except maybe Jan, was surprised when they filed for divorce. The ring-swallowing incident caused Todd some serious discomfort, and they had to cancel their honeymoon so he could go to the ER. They couldn't get their deposit back for the trip and the ER visit cost them even more money. They weren't exactly swimming in cash to begin with, 
and the mounting debts meant they lost the trailer they'd planned to rent after the wedding. With no other options, they moved into Todd's parents' house, crammed into his childhood bedroom. That's when things really started to spiral. Less than three months after the wedding, Todd's ex resurfaced, heavily pregnant with his second child. She demanded yet another shared month with Todd, but this time Jan wasn't having it. The ex took Todd to court for more child support, and Jan found herself working a second job to make ends meet, all while living with her in-laws. Then came the final straw. One day, after dropping Jan off at work, Todd sold her car. Just sold it like it was his to sell. Then, true to form, he disappeared for weeks. Jan lost both of her jobs because she couldn't get to work without her car. And to top it all off, she found out she was pregnant. When she told Todd, he accused her of cheating on him. In his mind, he could only father two children in a lifetime, and his ex had already hit that magic number. He refused to believe the child was his. 